Hello and welcome back to Mark's Garden UK at Rose Cottage near Nantwich in Cheshire. We are now well into autumn, in fact we're into November. It doesn't feel like it has been surprisingly mild so far, but I thought I might do a quick update on the wildlife garden before we put it to bed for the winter. And my wildlife garden includes this, the wildlife pond, and then over there on the other side I have a dense hedge for the wildlife to hide and shelter in and also for birds to nest in in the summertime. I also have some buddleia butterfly bushes there uh, which are actually white and bright pink but here look they've turned to seed heads which are this lovely kind of lime green colour and I will leave those on there because they may well be a food source for the birds in the winter time. Now I always prune these buddleias in the spring and there's a couple of reasons for, for pruning the buddleias. If you don't prune them they just go tall and tall and tall and these lovely blooms end up up there in the sky so by pruning them down to the base you end up with the blooms at eye level. But there's a video on pruning buddleia on my channel and I'll link it at the end of this one but the point being is anything I prune off there I put in a pile here in between the two buddleias and you can see there look a twig pile now that is a perfect hiding place for the wildlife vertebrates microorganisms and they'll all be in there for the winter time hiding or in dormancy and that's a perfect little microcosm of life there and that is the bottom end of the food chain which feeds onwards up the bird uh, the food chain to the birds and so on i've got a little grass pile there now grass piles are an interesting thing because actually if you dig into a grass pile there'll be some ambient heat in there that's the nitrogen in the grass decaying and uh, rotting down let's move along a little bit past the circular wildlife pond and i'll come back to the wildlife pond in a minute and give you a bit more of an overview of that but down here Underneath these two flags there's a little path which goes from over there in the dense corner hedge and it allows the wildlife to go underground to the pond and there's a little opening down there under that rock so any frogs or toads or newts that want to get safely from there to there in the springtime without being exposed to the open air where they may be predated can go underneath there. Down here is my log pile and again another great environment for wildlife half of it is buried in soil because i wanted to start the decay process by burying half the logs in soil and that helps again with the, uh, the ecosystem because it's all about encouraging all levels of the food chain at the back of that and underground there's a hibernaculum which is essentially a big chamber which i dug out and i filled with rocks and half plant pots terracotta plant pots and then i put some roofing felt over it and i buried it and then there is a soil pipe an old toilet soil pipe which leads into that underneath a flagstone at the back there you can't see it it's hidden and i will never know what's in there because i'll never disturb it but that is a hibernaculum and in that hibernaculum uh, there will be life um, retiring and retreating for the winter now the important thing about that hibernaculum is in that soil pipe I put a stick because the soil pipe is a slippery thing and if you put sticks in it it allows any wildlife that goes in to climb back out again but there we are a lovely underground mysterious chamber like I say I'll never know what's in there but I know it's there and it excites me to know it's there look at this here another buddleia these can be quite invasive these buddleias there's one there there's another here in America, in some states, these are actually banned because they're so invasive. And scientists have actually developed an infertile version of the buddleia, but here they are quite invasive and you can see these have self-seeded. That's why you see them on railway cuttings and railway sidings and up the side of mills in buildings in old cities because they've, they've spread on the wind and, and multiplied. So there we are, log pile, hibernaculum, buddleia, butterfly bush, and a little mini path underground there for the wildlife 
And then we move to the wildflower meadow. Now look at this. We're into November and it's still got lots of colour, lots of flowers on it. And those flowers, I imagine, will remain right up until the first deep frosts. And that's wonderful because there are actually still pollinating insects. In fact, there's an example of a little bee enjoying some nectar on that flower there. I'm trying to avoid putting my shadow where it is. But there, look, a bee on this warm November day still enjoying the nectar on those flowers. We've got pinks. We've got a bright orange there. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Bright orange. And then we've got yellows. And there is another purple one. They all seem to be the same shape and size, so it's probably a particular type of flower. There's a little fly on there. Can you see it? A little pollinating insect enjoying some nectar. Out the back there, I put about 50 sunflowers and they were supposed to be miniature ones. I think I must have misread the packet because they actually grew quite tall. You can see there's one up there in the sky. These two have leant across into the hedge. And if you can see it, in fact, I might wander up there and give you a better view. In fact, I'll do that now. I'll wander up there and I'll give you a better view. This is the mound in the corner where eventually I intend building a viewing platform. And that's the open countryside there. There's a canal in the distance over there. But I want to show you this. Now, had I supported these sunflowers, they would still be erect like that one. And that would have been fine. And when they did blow over in the wind, I was a little bit worried at first, but then I thought, hang on a minute, no, let's leave it. Let's leave it leaning up against the hedge here where the birds can sit in the tree all winter and enjoy the sunflower seeds. But not only birds, possibly even mice can climb up this branch and get to those as well. So I'm now quite relaxed, very relaxed about the fact that those have fallen down in some cases and are now leaning in a very relaxed state up here. Full little sunflower seeds. That was why I did it for the wildlife. Self-seeded oak tree there. And here's another view through the wildflower meadow, the pond possibly get the sun reflecting on the water surface there and there's the cottage in the distance i want to go round to the holly hedge so i'll go back i'll show you a little view of the field in the distance there's a lovely canal walk down there which i enjoy and we've got this dense holly hedge again great for the wildlife to shelter in and also for the birds to nest in i'll just carefully walk down here Look at these big boulders I've got here. I inherited those in the garden. But look at the moss on that. Isn't that beautiful? Wonderful. Several different types of moss on there. Love it. There must be about nine or ten of these big boulders. One, two, three, four, five. They go all the way around there. They're a bit like a circle of standing stones eventually. I'm going to lift these and put them in a circle around a bog garden. This curious looking object here is my bird feeder totem pole, which I made as a bit of fun a couple of weeks ago. I carved out this old tree trunk and I filled these holes on the face here with fat, suet and bird seed in the space of a week. It's all gone. And I did say I was going to put my camera on there and get some footage of the birds, but I never got around to doing that, but I will do. I'm going to refill that next week and I'm going to make a concerted effort to get some footage of the birds that come along. These fir cones were also filled with fat and bird seed. So there we are, we're helping the birds there and we're having a bit of fun making a totem pole. You can find the video on my channel. He's even got a tie look because I thought it looked like Roger Moore, so I gave him a tie. Look at the berries on that holly tree there. The point behind holly is if you want to get berries on your holly tree, as I've got here, and they are a great source of food, particularly for thrushes, you've got to have a male and a female. The male provides the pollen and the female provides the berries. There we go. Let's have a wander down to the wildlife pond. I hope my camera is holding steady enough as I wander around here. Here's the pond. Excuse me. I'm going to cough. I've just had COVID, so I'm going to have a little cough. <coughs> Sorry about that. The wildlife pond. 
supported and sponsored by pondkeeper.co.uk has been wonderful. I finished it this year, dug it by hand, using that long cardinal Irish spade there. That's the mound of earth that came out of it, which is now a pile of scrub for the wildlife. And the wildlife pond has settled in and matured over the summer. I've got irises, I've got water spearmint, I've got one of those, what do they call them? Horse tails, like a prehistoric plant there. I've got three of those. I've got some arum lilies here. Moving around, that's water spearmint down there. Two water lilies, one over there and one over there. They need to be moved slightly deeper so that they're in a slightly warm part of the pond. More arum lilies. And as we go round here, some more irises in the border there. That is brook lime. That is a plant which is uh, a favourite of newts. They lay their eggs on the leaves and then they wrap the leaves around the egg. So that's why that's there. It's a wildlife pond. That's a wildlife pond plant. Let's move around. Somebody did ask me if any of these plants have been particularly invasive. And happily, none of them have been invasive. I'm delighted with the way the brook lime has spread along here. My hope is that a newt will come through there and lay its eggs. I know I've got newts in my garden. I've seen them. I've shown you them in a video of that lovely mat there. Now I took a tiny piece from my sister-in-law's pond and it's spread out like that, beautiful. So no, none of these plants have been invasive, apart from perhaps the one plant which I didn't put in this pond, which is that duckweed. Can you see it there? Duckweed and there's several little blobs of it all the way around the pond. Again, I'm quite relaxed about it for now. It's not been too invasive and I actually do want to cover the water surface to stop light penetration. But next year, I imagine, I will have to start removing that mechanically. And I'll throw it over there and it can feed the wildflower meadow. Here's the rocky beach, which is deliberate. It's so that any mammals that fall in can escape. That's an important feature of any wildlife pond and indeed any garden pond. The iris, again, I, bought, I borrowed that, I stole it from my, uh, I didn't steal it, she said I could have it, but I, I took several of those from my uh, sister-in-law's pond. And actually they've all done really well. I just plunked them in between the pebbles and the rocks and they've all grown. That one's had a baby there next to it. These are great for wildlife because certain insects will land on there crawl down, lay its eggs and then crawl back up and fly off. And then the larval stage of the, the insect, whether it be a, a dragonfly or a nymph or something, will stay in the pond. And then eventually when it goes back to the insect stage, it will climb up the same reed. So with a wildlife pond, it's great to have something that penetrates the water surface and takes you from the world above the water to the world below the water. That's a stone, a big stone, which has been very useful for birds and wasps to come and sit on and have a drink. And the, the birds love coming down out of the hedge and bathing at the water's edge there. There and there, you can just see a tiny little white flower there. They are water hawthorns. Now I learned an interesting thing about the water hawthorn. What I'd observed was Every time the sun came out, it died back and I thought it had died completely. And then when it went cool again, it suddenly sprung back into life. Then I was watching a program on television where they were talking about the water hawthorn. I'll get a bit closer. It goes dormant in warm weather. Isn't that curious? And then it comes back out again in cool weather. So every time it goes cool, these spring back into life. And that's just flowering. It's a lovely white flower on it again pondkeeper.co.uk um, and I'm forever grateful providing me with many of these plants so I'm quite happy to mention them and have a look at them if you decide on a, a water project next year so there we go that's uh, the wildlife pond I'm excited about the prospects for the wildlife pond because I did this to encourage frogs, toads and newts. I know I've got newts. I've definitely seen toads. Funnily enough, I've never actually seen a frog in this garden. But in the spring, when the water starts to warm up and it starts to have algal blooms and starts to go a little bit stagnant, the frogs, toads and newts in the surrounding countryside will smell it 
and we'll come towards it and hopefully make a home to lay eggs and hopefully in the spring we'll have tadpoles in there there we are a little update of the wildlife pond it's a bit of a mess over here i decided to remove a conifer the conifer bits are still on the ground waiting to be tidied up but that is my little bug hotel i've stripped it down i've left it planted and i've put gashes and marks and drilled holes all up and down the trunk for bugs to hide in so again and i've got sticks at the bottom for nature to inhabit there we go a quick guided tour of the wildlife corner of the garden from Budlia to log pile to hibernaculum to wildlife pond to wildflower meadow to totem pole to holly hedge hope you've enjoyed that i'll see you soon for some more wildlife garden adventures bye for now mm -hmm.